the outline. Yep. Anybody need the outline? Yeah. 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 Stage two was worse than stage one, right? 
So in other words, the curses that we're about to read, this is the stage, in other words, the punishment is worse than stage two. So he says, if you don't obey me in this stage, since you did not obey me in stage two, I got to give you another curse, which is worse than stage two. Okay? It's seven times worse than stage two, meaning it's 14 times worse than stage one. Just remember that. So let's see what stage three talks about. These six stages of punishment. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to turn it to mine now. On your outline, it says uh, attack and destination, right? And that's verse 21. All right, 21 through 22. Let's read those verses. And if even then you will not obey me. See, that's what he said. If you didn't obey me in stage two, this is what he's talking about. This is what's now you move into stage three. The, another, the curse gets worse. And if you even then you will not obey me and listen to me, I will send you seven times more plagues. I mean, seven times worse than the last seven, which is verse 22, I, because of your sin. I will send wild animals to kill your children and destroy your cattle and reduce your numbers so that your roads will be deserted. So notice he says, uh, Israel, if you don't obey me, you're going to lose everything. Right? You're going to lose. You're going to become desolate. This speaks of attacks that will come upon us, watch this, suddenly and unexpectedly, so spiritually, how do we lose everything? So if he says, I'm going to take away your animals and your children, spiritually speaking, when you walk in spiritual darkness, meaning spiritual disobedience, as Christians, you begin to lose. What do you lose? You won't grow. You, you, you can't duplicate yourself. You won't have, watch this, spiritual children. In other words, if you're walking in darkness and walking in disobedience, who want to who want to listen to you and look at your life and say, uh, yeah, I want to follow her. I want to follow him. You can't produce spiritual children. Nobody's going to want to follow you. In other words, your witness is going to be uh, impaired. Nobody can get saved under you. See, watch this. It's our job to duplicate ourselves as Christians, just like you duplicate yourself when you got married and had kids. Yes, sir. Seven times worse. 
we will receive attacks from the devil. But watch this. And you know, we do get attacks all the time. Mm -hmm. Even if you walk in obedience, you're going to get attacks. So you said, what, what's the problem? Once again, you can be attacked from the devil and walk in obedience and still, watch this, grow spiritually. But the curse is, or the problem is, you're not growing spiritually. You're not growing spiritually. Let me tell you something. Uh, when people tell you that the church should not grow, uh, they're wrong. I, I don't know where they get that from, that the church should not grow, but the church should grow. Worldwide would not be here for 69 years if they didn't grow. There's churches who shut down after two years. As a matter of fact, when I started the church, I started, I was, you know, because we're very heavy into statistics. They said this. It was the, here's the statistics. Of every new church that starts, they don't make it past the second year. About well, half of them. They shut down in the second year. Why is that? Well, why is it? Here's a church that's 69 years old. We got churches in the city 100 years old, right? So, so, and they not, no, they not mega churches either. That's not the point. At least they were growing in a hundred years. How is it you got a ministry and then you close, you shut it down because of no growth? Something is wrong. We must grow. The church has to grow. Even if you grow slowly, it doesn't matter. Grow. We have to grow. So, evangelism is very key. Uh, as we get some of the things taken care of here from, here from our report on Sunday. But as we take care of some of the building needs here, we're going to talk about evangelism. We have to. We have to go into the neighborhoods. We have to somehow reach the people in this neighborhood and let them know we're here. Now watch this. Everybody not going to come. We know that. But at least we went out and told them. Right? We let them know we're here. And God, because we're praying, and by the power of the Holy Spirit is going to touch some of them to come and be a part of this ministry. Remember, it's not our ministry. It's the Lord's ministry. You can't save nobody. It's the Holy Spirit that saves. So when the Holy Spirit touches somebody's heart to belong, to come and join this church, that was God's work. He just used you to do it. So we can't really pat ourselves on the back. If anybody joined this church, you better, we should be shouting all over this place. Because as bad as we are, we thank God, Lord, you still use me as bad as I am. People still get saved as bad as I am. People still want to come to this church as bad as I am. You still use me, because we're not perfect. You still use me from the power of the Holy Spirit to be a light to somebody in this world and they, that they can see Christ and repent of their sins and say, I want eternal life. That is the purpose of the church. Now, after we set that part of getting them saved, okay, yeah, let them get all join the programs, let them join auxiliaries, let them give their gifts, then they can begin to help us grow as well. That's, this is the purpose of the church. Well, watch this. If we have a church where all we do is socialize with each other, we still go die. See, we want to socialize, and this is why I don't understand why we do this. We want to socialize with churches. We want to have church service after church service after church service. We want to go to this church and fellowship. We want to go to this church and fellowship. Now, now I'm telling you, I don't see a scripture in the Bible that says we're supposed to spend most of our time fellowshipping with one another. I read, it says, go out into the world. Right? Compel them to come. Go into the hedges and to the highways and compel. Meaning you eagerly are telling people, come on, come on in, come on in. Now, you know, we used to, when I was growing up, people had their little barbecue, churches had their little barbecue dinners out there. And okay, now you sell the barbecue dinners to bring people in. Okay, that's not a scripture either. How about us, how about us have a budget somewhere so okay, we're going to give away these many ribs. How many people gonna show up on that corner? Oh my goodness. Y'all know they get the free rib that is over at that church on the corner. Now when they stop by, we gonna give them what? The real things and the gospel. And, and, and how about having a revival outside? When, 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 when we gonna do that? When we gonna have put some speakers outside, put them in the parking lot, and tell the church, tell the people in the neighborhood, okay, 
in this couple of weeks, it's summertime. I heard my pastor say this about revival season. The women got three months of summer. Use them wisely. We are so stuck up in these four walls in the summertime. You know wintertime coming. You got enough time to be in these walls. But when it's summer and hot, we need to be right out there with them. I said, oh, that's a good idea. We should have some events outside. Our evangelism events. Not just events for us to have fun. I'm talking about events that will draw people. Draw people. When I hear people talk about their longevity of churches, my family been in this church for 20 or 30 years, that's fine. Your idea is, I want some new families to come in so they can say 20 years from now, my family been here for 20 and 30 years. See, we gotta always keep growing. We have to. So this, this spiritual threat, number three, if we walk in disobedience, we won't grow, right? Let's go to number four. He says this, stage number four, invasion. So remember, invasion is worse than the last stage. It's, it's worse than attack and desolation. So let's read verse 26. Verse 26, I mean, verse 23, I'm starting at 23. We're going to go to 26, 23 to 26. It says this. And if even this will not reform you. So if you don't straighten up at the high, cause desolation and attack to you, he's telling Israel, now I'm going to put another bad, uh, worse stage is going to come upon you. So he says in 23, and if even this will not reform you, but you will continue to walk against my wishes, then I will walk against your wishes. And I, even I, will personally smite and smite you with seven times for your sins. Seven times worse than the last one. Verse 25, I will revenge the breaking of my covenant by bringing war against you. You will flee to your cities and I will send a plague among you there. And you will be conquered by your enemies. I will destroy your food supply so that one oven will be large enough to bake all the bread available for ten entire families. And you will still be hungry after your penitence has been doled out to you. So once again, this stage, because they didn't repent in the last stage, is worse than the last one. What did he say he's going to do to them? Looking at your outline. Uh, this stage is a punishment of moral famine and spiritual despair. You will lose everything spiritually. So once again, you can't grow. You can't have spiritual children because you're not walking in obedience. So what happens after that stage when we begin to continue to walk? We lose spiritually. In other words, because uh, we're going to get to a phrase, and I love talking about it because a lot of people don't like talking about it. What is salvation? How how can somebody can somebody lose their salvation? We're going to talk about that in a minute. But watch this. He says you're going to lose spiritually everything if you walk in disobedience. So let me put this thought in your mind. If we're walking in these stages, man, they're getting worse. Something is wrong somewhere. If you see a person walking in disobedience to God all the time, the question is raised, are they really saved? How could a person really walk in this, this type of lifestyle in these six stages? God throwing these punishments at them so they can try to get it right and turn around, they still don't repent. So you got a question. I always call them, you got two kinds of Christians. The people that act like Judas, who call themselves Christians, and then you got the real saved people. Amen. Because some people thought Judas was saved. Some people still today think that Judas went to heaven. They say he was he was born to, he had no uh, Judas, he couldn't help it. He was born to betray Jesus. So God could not really put that against him. So if he was born to betray Jesus, that was that was what he was supposed to do. He was born to do that. He didn't have no choice of that. Let me ask you, did Judas have a choice? He had a choice. Yeah, just like it read. Uh, I think I just preached on it uh, before. It says they were sitting there eating the Passover lamb. And somebody said, Jesus says, one of you are going to betray me, right? He said that. And then all of them said, it is, is it I, Lord? All of them said it. And then John, who wrote it, 
leaned over to Jesus because he was the closest to Jesus. And Jesus, who is going to betray you? Jesus said to him only, the one who I dip this bread in and I pass this piece of bread to, that's the one. Only John knew that. Because Peter leaned over to John. John, would you ask Jesus who it is? And he did. He asked Jesus who it was. And Jesus told him, it's the one who I passed. So he dipped it and gave it to Judas. Right? Then, now watch this. The disciples still didn't even know that it was Judas who was going to betray Jesus. They thought when Jesus says, go do what you have to do, they thought Judas went to go pay some meal because, you know, he was the treasurer. But notice what it says after Jesus says, go do what you have to do. Then the scripture say, and then Satan entered him. So when he, what, made his decision, then the devil used him. Watch this. When we make a decision, so you can't say, you can't blame the devil. The devil made me do it. You, you, you can't use that phrase, the devil made me do anything. Because once you make a decision to disobey God, then the demon can use you. Yeah, they use you after you make the decision. They make the suggestion, you make the decision, and they go ahead and help you do the decision that you just made. That's all they do. That's what Satan does every single time we sin. You wrestle with this thing in your mind, the sin that you're about to do. You make up in your mind that you're going to do it. And then after you make up your mind, that's your decision that you're going to do it. Uh, then the demons or Satan, they do what they have to do. If you don't believe me, I think it's James, the first chapter. Uh, and write that down. The first five verses, maybe the first seven verses of, of James says this. Uh, I think sin, the sin starts with a thought, and after with the thought, it produces uh, sin in the heart, and after sin in the heart, it produces what? Death. James, what's that? James what? James one. James one. Yeah, James one. I think it's James one. It produ sin produces death. So the question is. Is the person really saved? Now, if they're falling into these five destructive stages, it's not up to you and I to realize if they're saved or not, because I believe this. As long as you got blood running warm in your body, you have a chance to get it right. So who am I to tell you? Now, I can tell you this. I really don't tell people that they're going to hell. I tell them this. Now, because I don't know if you're going to make it or not. So I tell them this, listen, if you continue on the road that yeah, you're on, yeah, yeah. hell will be your home. Yeah. Now, you might get it right next year. You might get it right 10 years from now. You might be bishop somebody 5, 20, 15 years from now. So I'm not going to put you in hell because I have no hell to put you in, no heaven to put you in. But I'm here to tell you, if you don't make Jesus your Savior, you're on the wrong road. I don't want to hear that Jesus stuff. I don't want to, okay. Today, you don't want to hear about Jesus. But God knows which day, if you are, if your name written in the last book of life, he knows what day you are going to hear Jesus if your name is written in the last book of life. So see, I don't stress out when I walk into somebody and try to talk about Jesus and they reject me and they cuss me out and they say, I don't want to hear about Jesus. No, I don't want no track. No, I'm still going to drink. I'm still going to party. I'm still going to shack up. I'm still going to have kids, 10 kids by 10 different women. I'm going to live my life. I'm going to live it up. They, 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 yeah, I don't want to hear about Jesus and Christianity. I don't want that. But see, he may say that. She may say that now. Amen. And they will reject you. But you're supposed to keep praying for them. Amen. No matter what, you keep praying because you don't know their final end. So you just got to keep preaching to them. Keep talking to them. And later on, some of them that you witness to, they gonna turn to Jesus. They will. I remember uh, years ago, uh, somebody wrote me a letter, and this is from high school. Uh, it was like maybe 10 years after I was high, uh, out of high school, uh, I ran into a person, and they wrote me a letter from high school saying how they, I never really talked back and forth to this person, but they just sent me a letter to let me know how my life affected them in high school. They became a Christian because of what we were doing in high school. Now, isn't that something that somebody can encourage you to say, you keep doing what you're doing. 
because you probably didn't know while you as a young person, all of us were young in high school, while you were doing the gospel thing and we were singing and talking about Jesus, guess what? I became a Christian. That's very encouraging. But you know, we're going to get more no's than we get yeses. You already know that. So never get discouraged when you're trying to talk to your family members and to your friends and to your neighbors about Jesus and they reject you because you don't know. They could turn tomorrow. They could say, Lord, I repent. And guess what? They could do it on me right before their deathbed. And you mad because you've been in church 50 years talking about you've been working for the Lord and here they got five minutes to live and they say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. And he said, that's not fair, Lord. I've been working for you for 40 years. They didn't pay no tithes. They didn't work no auxiliary. They didn't sing in a choir. They didn't do nothing but God let them in. Because they repented. So guess what? Just because you've been working for the Lord for 40 years, he's going to bless you. Guess what? You're going to be blessed. If you're really working for God, God says you will be rewarded for working in his on this battlefield, well, until you die. Don't worry about them who made it in. You just thank God that you make it in. Right? So let's go to the, so that destruction, that's number five. That, what's that? Yeah, destruction number five. That was four. Invasion. Let's go to destruction number five. Oh, stage number five, which is destruction. Now, watch this. Remember, it gets worse. We only got two stages left. These are stages of a person as they get worse and worse and worse, which eventually when we get to stage six, I'm going to say something about that first. We already talked about a little bit about are they really saved. So verse 27, all the way through verse 32, stage five, destruction. So watch what he says. And if you still won't listen to me, you still walk in the peace. After all that you went through, you still won't listen to me. Watch what he says to me. Oh, baby. Then, verse 28, then I will let loose my great anger and send you seven times greater punishment for your sins. 29, you shall eat your own sons and daughters. Oh, Lord. Did you hear what he said? Verse 30, and I will destroy the altars of the hills where you worship your idols, and I will cut down your incense altars, leaving your dead bodies to rot among your idols, and I will abhor you. Verse 31, I will make your cities desolate and destroy your places of worship and will not respond to your incense offerings. Verse 32, yes. I will desolate your land. Your enemy shall live in it. Also be amazed at what I have done to you. So he told Israel in stage five, since you all, I tried to get you to turn in stage one, you didn't turn back. I tried to get you to turn in stage two, you didn't turn all the way down to five. He gets the five, God, you would think, what's worse than after this? Because we got one more stage. He said, in stage five, you're going to eat your own kids. And I said, no, God didn't let them do that. Yes, he did. Let me tell you what happened when that happened. The terrible year was, in history, if you look it up, happened in 70 AD, 40 years after Jesus rose from the dead. 40 years later, uh, Titus, King Titus, uh, came in, and they totally destroyed Jerusalem. They killed all, most of the Jews if the, that, that was there in Jerusalem at the time and scattered the rest. So the disciples were scattered. As a matter of fact, all over the world, uh, it was so bad, so devastating that guess what? Uh, the Israelites, in order to survive, had to eat their own, some of them ate their own children, not all of them. That happened in history for them. Everything that God said because of their disobedience happened to them. So what is this for us? Let's look on our outline, spiritually speaking. When we disobey God, there will be a decline in, in spirituality among the next generation of family, families to moral decay. So when he says, you will eat your own children, how do we translate that to us? Watch this. If we, as a generation of so-called Christians, continue to walk in disobedience, the next generation 
of so-called Christians are not going to walk in obedience. They are walking spiritual decay. In other words, they are actually going to walk just like the world walk. They still call themselves Christians. Guess what? We see that happening now. Did you know you got some preachers out there ordaining homosexuals to be pastors? Yes. You know there's some pastors out there that marry homosexuals? Yes. Uh-huh. They out there now. That's moral decay. I'm talking about, right? We're not talking about a new kind of church. We talk about people who call themselves Christians. That's what, so you teaching from the pulpit a whole generation of young people telling them it's okay to live in your lifestyle, watch this, and still say you serve God. So if you don't let the homosexuals get married in your church, you can't say nothing to the guy who got five kids living in his wife, with five women and ten kids living in his house living all together. You can't say nothing to him, you're going to be your bishop, you're going to be your child. <laughs> Why are you going to say anything to him? Why are you going to say anything to the pedophile since you're going to let everybody else do whatever they want to do? You got this guy who's like messing with kids. Well, no, Lord, Lord, forgive me every day, so y'all are still going to be your pastor. That's how bad it's going to get. And as a matter of fact, preachers have been caught already. Pastors. Okay, we say the Catholic Church. Maybe we say the Catholic Church. Did you know out of all the years when they brought them up to church, just recently they had this big old meeting in the Catholic Church where the bishop and the pope and all the bishops got together. And they said, yes, it was wrong that these men were messing with these children for hundreds of years. Yes, we're going to bring down a hammer on them. You know how many people they sent to jail? Maybe one or two. Maybe one or two. So what did they do with the priest that got caught messing with the kids? They just moved him to a new parish. They didn't tell on him. They just, oh, God, we just going to pull you out of that church and put you over here in another church so you can keep, continue to do what you did. Moral decay. This is what Jesus and God is talking about here in this chapter of moral decay. When the church is okay with that, then you know that that part, so-called church, is not right. We got to stand up for what is right. If you got to go through 10, 20 preachers, then that's what you got to do. We want what? To live in holiness and righteousness. But he says, if we continue as a church, as a generation, or to our church as a whole, to walk in disobedience and call ourselves the church, we won't be the church. We're not the church. We're something else. Even though we want to claim the title for Christianity. I tell people this all the time. I'm not uh, trying to be a pastor for popularity. So if you call me old school because I won't accept homosexuality. If you call me old school because I won't ordain a woman to be my assistant minister, then call me old school. Because it's really not me because I'm going to direct you to the Bible. Show me a woman that ain't a church. In the Bible, I will ordain a woman to be sitting right next to me in the pulpit. I'll do it. Tomorrow I'll do it. But they don't have any scripture to show me. Uh, I believe the scripture says that men are to be the leaders of the church. That's what the scripture says. I, I'm just telling you, don't get mad at me. Look at what the scripture says. Well, how come women can't be leaders of the church like the men? Uh, Paul said it like this in 1 Timothy. Look it up. Uh, because of her being deceived by the devil. Amen. The man has to be her cover. That's what it says. So how is it that we got this big wave now, even in the Baptist church, I was looking on Facebook the other day, and I forgot what church was ordaining a female to be their pastor. Uh, this is a historic Baptist church. I think I forgot, man, either it was Second Baptist, right here in Sydney Church, yeah, you know Second Baptist is almost 100 some years old. They ordained some more. Uh, female to be their pastor. Now, watch this. Should I write a book about it? And should I get my picket sign out and go over to the second king and go over to the second Baptist and say, this is wrong. You shouldn't have no woman. No, that's not my job. My job is you do whatever you want to do at second Baptist, but over here in Worldwide, while I'm in the leadership, there will not be a woman in leadership over men. Amen. And in only two areas. Watch this. 
The only two areas that a woman cannot lead the man is his home, if he's married to her, or the church. Because these two spots, the husband and being a male in male leadership means this, he's your spiritual leader. That's it. So if a woman wanted to be president of the United States, that's okay because that's not spiritual. If she wanted to open up her own business and be the president and be an owner of her house, an owner of her business, that's okay. If she wanted to be the principal, if she wanted to be superintendent, that's okay. Two places she can't lead a man. That's his home and the church. That's it. That's what the Bible says. So don't say we're against female leadership. Uh -huh. We're against female leadership in the home and the church. How is it that, the, watch this, here it is, one, one person told me, they, they talked about it this way. Okay, so they was visiting churches and they was thinking about looking for a church to join and they went to a church to visit and there was a female pastor and there was a woman, she was telling, talking about her husband going to visit the churches. So there was one particular church where her and her husband began to argue because he wanted to join the church where the woman was the pastor. So she said to him, it was real, it was real funny, she looked at him, she said, so, so you don't go to a church where you don't listen to a woman tell you what to do, and I can't even get you to take out the garbage. <laughs> you don't listen to me. But you know what she said? No, we're not going to this church. Because, oh, you'll sit under her and, 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 and faithfully do what she tells you to do. But when I ask you to do something, you're not going to do it. Remember that fight I told you between the men and the women according to the Bible? Yeah, so that leadership, that leadership is not there. But this shows moral to case. So this destruction in stage five, verse 27 to 32, means this. We got to stay away from moral decay. And one of the things that help us stay away from moral decay is this. Let's keep focus on the Ten Commandments. I mean, see, that's where we can start. Because when you stay focused on the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not have no other God before you. Don't make any graven images out of me. Honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. So that's ten right there. And if you can't remember the ten, remember the one that Jesus said, the eleventh commandment, love your neighbor like you love yourself. So that so you stay away from all moral decay, all of it, if you do that, right? Watch this. So now we get to the next one. We get to stage number six, the last and worst stage. What would happen if a person, they ignored stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. They ignored stage five. You don't think you can get worse than stage five. You were eating your own kids. You don't think you can get worse than that. Let's see. Yeah, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse than that. Verse 33 through 39. Scattering. Watch this. Uh, 33. I will scatter you out among the nations, destroying you with wars as you go. Your land shall be desolate and your cities destroyed. Verse 34, 35. When at last the land will rest and make up for the many years you refuse to let it lie idle, for it will lie desolate all the years that you are captives in enemy lands. Yes, then the land will rest and enjoy its Sabbath. It will make up for the rest you didn't give it every seventh year when you lived upon it. Verse 36, and for those who are left alive, I will cause them to be dragged away to distant lands as prisoners of war and slaves. There they will live in constant fear. The sound of a leaf driven in the wind will send them fleeing as through chased by a man with the sword. They shall fall when no one is pursuing them. Verse 37, yes, Though none pursue, they shall stumble over each other in flight, as though fleeing in battle with no power to stand before their enemies. Verse 38, you shall perish among the nations and be destroyed among your enemies. Those left shall pine away in enemy lands because of their sins, the same sins as those of their fathers. So the last stage, which is the worst. God said, if you don't turn 
from stage one through stage five, the last stage is I gotta scatter you. I gotta let you go. I gotta this, this you don't even have a relationship with me, which exposes the point where we talked about Judas, it exposes the true nature of a person who is really saved in the first place. So watch this. It's not our job, it is not my job to come to church every Sunday to find out if you really saved or not. See, because this is not the place to do that. This is what we're supposed to do. I'm supposed to come and preach the gospel, you're supposed to listen to it, and then go out and live according to God's word, right? So when Jesus says, let the wheat and the tear grow together, and in the end, I'll do the separating, what do you think he was talking about? Because when Jesus said, let the wheat and tear grow together, he gave a parable and said, a, a, a farmer a planted some seed, but then the enemy came. And planted his seed in the same vineyard. Now, I don't know if you know the difference between wheat and tares. Watch this. You can plant tares. Tares are weeds. You can plant them with good wheat, and you won't be able to tell the wheat, the weeds from the wheat until it's what? Fully grown. They're growing together. So when the person go out to harvest and grab it, they say, oh, I gotta separate the wheat from the actual harvest. And that takes time, doesn't it? You gotta take the weeds apart, separate from. God says, so if you got people, this is how it is in the church. We got all kinds of people, people who say they're saved and don't live it, and people who are saved and live it. So it's not my job to be the Holy Ghost police to find out if you live it or not. Mm -hmm. That, you gonna expose yourself on that. So I gotta make a decision if you are totally exposed openly. See, I'm not gonna say nothing until I'm sure that you are doing what they say you're doing, especially if you are leading this church. Give a perfect example. So if I'm a drug if I if I'm a drug addict, right? But you didn't know I was a drug addict, and I'm on drugs. You didn't know, but you found out. What is the process for the church to do? Let's see. Let's see. It's interesting. What kind of comments can I get? What should I do if you find out I was doing that? Go to your go to your first. No, I'm talking about me, the pastor. If you found out, <laughs> who coming to me? Who got to come to me first? Who, the deacons gonna come to me. What are they gonna do first? They gonna talk to me. So they got the evidence. Let's say they got the evidence. It is true. Now what they got to do? Pray. What you say? Pray. They gotta pray. Because, watch this, the first thing is, let's see if we can salvage him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's the first thing. Give me, for example, Jimmy Swagger, 1987, caught with a prostitute, right? Now, he's a part of a whole organization. They went to him. And they did not want to sit him down as a pastor. They went to him, say, because uh, he was a well-known, famous preacher. They went to him, the leaders of that organization said, listen, Jimmy, uh, we're going to sit you down for a while. And all we want you to do is go get some counseling. He didn't want to do that. He didn't want to do it. So when he decided not to do it, he said, okay, we got to let you go. Mm -hmm. Give you another perfect example. Carlton Pearson. Carlton Pearson was also under a denomination. He gets up in his church one Sunday, his 20,000 members, and say, uh, there is no hell. The bishop say, okay, come on, we got to talk. Let's talk. Carlton, come here. Now, I know you've been preaching for 40 years since she was nine years old. That's, that's your history. That's your story. You told us you've been preaching. Now, you're 50 something years old, and you're not going to tell us that there's no hell. Where's your proof? They pulled him in front of the council. Everybody tried to talk to him. He said, No, nope, I'm still going to preach. There is no hell. Bye, Carlton. Bye. You got to go. That's what you're supposed to do. So if the deacons come to me and they say, Eli, we know you got you need some help, go get some help. I'm gonna tell you, no, I don't want no help. No, I'm still, you gotta put me out there. Okay, that's what we're gonna do too. We're gonna go ahead and put you out. But if I said, I'm sorry, I need help. You, you should treat me just like GM, Christ, and everybody else. When they find out somebody got an addiction, they say, listen, why don't you go to the Betty Ford Clinic and we're going to pay for it. Here you go. We're going to take your salary and we help you go get some help somewhere. Now, once you get some help and come back, you do it again. Now we're going to have to start the process because you really know what we're right. And we want somebody to actually lead the church. See, that's reconciliation. 
for a church. So he says here in this last stage, listen Israel, if you don't listen to me, God tried, watch this, at every stage to turn them around. He did. He did this to them. He did that to them. They still wouldn't repent. So finally, in this last stage, he said, I got to let you know. Now, just remember, he's not letting go all of them. He's only letting go those who do what? Who disobeyed him. There was always, in Israel's history, always a remnant that's going to believe. There was always a group that did it right. But half of the jokers, they were doing everything they wanted to do. They were, and God said, I'm not putting up with that. So let me tell you when this happened to them, when God scattered them. Uh, once again, same thing, 70 AD, 40 years after Jesus uh, uh, died on the cross and rose 40 years later. Uh, I told you the king, Titus, came in. He scattered them all over the world. As a matter of fact, Jerusalem was totally destroyed in 70 AD. 2,000 years later, let's go to 1948, let's go there. 1948, Israel, for 2,000 years, wasn't even a nation. Did you know that? For two, it wasn't until 1948 that they became a nation again. So who was in the land for those 2,000 years that they were not in the land? The Palestinians. The Palestinians been there so long that the Muslims came in. And they came in and took that land over, right? And they built the dome, the rock dome, wherever it is to Muhammad, right? That is a sacred site to them in Jerusalem. So get this picture in your mind. In Jerusalem, you now got the rock, the dome, where the Muslims walk around. Then you got the, the Jewish temple, that, not the temple, but the church. They call themselves Judaism because they don't have a temple. Then you got the Christians over there. This is where Jesus rose, right? So you got three religions in Jerusalem right now fighting. So let me tell you what's going to happen in the future. Uh, Israel is totally going to take over the land. They got to build a temple in their homeland. So one of them, uh, the, the Muslims got to go. So now you know there's going to be another war coming out. You, you, you already know. So watch this. They were scattered for two thousand years. So when you hear about Israel fighting the Palestinians, that's the fight. The Palestinians said, we've been here two thousand years. How you guys going to come back and take over our land? They said, well, it was our land first. <laughs> that's what you hear uh, Benjamin, not uh, the Prime Minister Benjamin over there saying. He said, listen, it was our land first. Uh, my forefather had this land. We want it back. They said, well, you let it go for two thousand years. We got it now. And guess what? They're going to continue to fight all the way until Jesus comes. That's what the scripture says. So guess what? We got to learn, number one, we don't want to be scattered. But watch this. Even though God had all those six stages of destruction, do you know God is a merciful God? Yes, yeah. Look at verse 40 to 46. Watch this. Out of all that destruction we read, out of all of that, God still told them, if you turn, I'll forgive you. That's how merciful he is. Let's read it. Verse 40 through 46. This is, this is God's love. His relentless love. Watch this. Verse 40. But at last, they shall confess their sins and their father's sins of treachery against me. Because they were against me, I was against them and brought them into the land of their enemies. And when at last their evil hearts are humbled, and they accept the punishment I send them for their sins. Watch this, verse 42. Then I will remember again my promise to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will remember the land and its desolation. 43. For the land shall enjoy its Sabbath as it lies desolate. But then, at last, they shall accept their punishment for rejecting my laws and for despising my rule. Verse 44. But despite all they have done, I will not utterly destroy them and my covenant with them for I am Yahweh or Jehovah their God. Verse 45 For their sakes I will remember my promise to their ancestors to be their God. For I brought their forefathers out of Egypt as all the nations watched and wondered I am Jehovah. Verse 46 These were the laws, ordinances and instructions that Jehovah gave to the people of Israel through Moses 
on Mount Sinai. Did you hear that? God said, out of all that destruction, he says, and if they humble themselves, then I will still forgive them. Isn't that something? God is a forgiving God. And I told you, remember, that's why I said, you can see somebody's life going out of control for 40 years. But somehow the Holy Spirit get a hold to him and they turn around and here you are, you had him in hell ever since he was 12 years old. <laughs> now he's 60. Yeah, I told you he wasn't no good. He ain't gonna never be no good. He's just like his daddy, his daddy wasn't no good. And probably just like his granddaddy, he wasn't no good either. Right? That's how we look at people and God said, guess what? I'm gonna turn him around and aid. I've seen people come to Christ and aid. I've seen people who live their lives like the devil until they was dead and turn their hearts around. So we don't know. He says somebody will turn around. So watch this repentance. This final verse takes us right back to the beginning of Leviticus of the book and even at the end, which we're going to talk about next week. These are the terms of agreement. I love this. We have to understand that if Israel obeyed the law of God, if they, they can walk in blessings. If they disobey, they walk in the curses. But watch this. If they repented from these curses, guess what? God said, I'm going to bless them all over again. Yeah. Now watch this. These closing verses remind us this, that God will always come back and give us mercy when we do one thing, when we humble ourselves. You can be walking in sin, but once you get tired of the devil beating you up, <laughs> and, and maybe some of you going to turn around and maybe some not, but those who get tired of disobeying God and turning around and humble themselves, he said, what? I will remember my covenant with them, even if they broke the covenant in verse 15. Now, the two key verses, you probably underline this, uh, underline verse 42 and 45. This, this emphasized that God said he promised who? Abraham. He says, when they humble themselves, I'm going to remember the covenant I made with their forefathers, which is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And can you tell me, anybody, what was that covenant he made with Abraham? What was the covenant that God said he would never, I don't care how bad Israel get, God told Abraham, he, gave, he made him a promise back in Genesis 12. And he said something to him that he said, I will never, Abraham, I don't care how many kids you have, look at the stars in the sky, that's how many children you're going to have, and I will never break that covenant with you. Now, what is that covenant that God made with Abraham? Anybody remember what that covenant was? If you don't, let's go to Genesis 12. Go to Genesis 12. you got to circle this because you're going to tell me tonight, is this covenant Real did God keep his word? I'm telling you, God always keeps his word. He made a covenant with Abraham, and he didn't care what his Abraham's kids did, he gonna bring this covenant to pass. He's gonna make this promise come true through Abraham's children. You gotta see this a wonderful, wonderful covenant. So I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you this as we go through. Same thing about us. Let's start with verse 1. Verse 1, chapter 12, Genesis. Now, the Lord has said to, said to Abram, Get thee out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. Not we were talking about that. Verse 3. And you shall be a what? Blessing. Abraham, you are going to be a blessing. Here it is, verse 3. Here's, here's the promise. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curse you. Here's the blessing. Please underline this last part. And in you, Abraham, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Did you hear that? This is before he made Israel. This is before anything. God took a man called Abram, who, who was 90 years old and had no kids, and told him while he had no children, you're going to have more kids than anybody. You're going to 
have more kids in it. And as, as a matter of fact, April, Abraham, uh, it's going to be because of you that every family that comes after you, I don't care what uh, generation they live in, I don't care what country they live in, every family because of you, Abraham, going to be blessed. So how, how did that happen? Because as you speed up, Abraham had Isaac, right? Isaac had 12 sons. Those 12 sons became the nation of Israel. Watch this. Everybody, this, this is what you're talking about, God. All the families are going to be here. No. So what God is saying is, you take down, you follow Abraham's family line. Let's keep going. That was just three generations. Let's go all the way down to 42 generations. Who ends up in Abraham's family line? Jesus. And what did Jesus do for everybody in the world? Died for them. So through Jesus, Abraham's son, all of the families shall be blessed. So God didn't care what Abraham's kids did. He will always have a remnant in that family line, those 42 generations. Yeah, half of them, most of them did wrong, but there was a group. If you read, if you read from Genesis to Malachi, there was always a group of Israelites who did it right. And I'm here to tell you, from the time the church, on the day of Pentecost, became the church, from the time they were filled with the Holy Spirit till now, you had people that did it wrong, but you still got people that did it right. You got people who are ordained, who are ordained homosexuals. You got people who call themselves Christians, who worship idols. You got people who sacrifice kids in the name of Christ. You had people in the Crusades back in the 1500s that killed people in the name of Jesus. You had people did it wrong all the time. You had groups of denominations raised up and say, I don't want none of my preachers to be married, so you got to be celibate. And they say they love the Lord so much that they were celibate, but they really needed to be married. So that's why they started messing with other folks. See, had you got to get married in the first place, the temptation to try to mess with somebody else wouldn't have been there. Because God says in the scripture, anybody that want to be celibate, let that be their, their decision, not the church's decision. Right? Because I believe people are celibate. I believe people have committed themselves to be celibate, but that had to be their decision. I can't force celibacy on you. And he says, listen, if we can't force cel celibacy on you, then it's better to marry than to burn. Well, you know, I don't want to get married yet, but you want to do everything that married people do. I ain't ready to get married yet, but you want to have 10 kids. But I ain't married, I ain't ready to get married yet. What's the purpose of what's the purpose of having a relationship? How is it that you're gonna live in a house with your girlfriend or boyfriend, have five kids, live like a husband and wife, you live like you a family, but you don't want to make it legitimate? I, I love what Judge Judy says all the time when couples come before her and they broke up, they've been together for five years, living in the same house, and then they come to her because they broke up, and then she said, Oh, okay, what y'all want me to do? So you think you want to get, do you have all the receipts that you had for the past five years? And you think I'm going to sit here in this, this stand and separate what y'all wanted to play house. Y'all wanted to play house. So therefore, since we can't get all your bills together, y'all decide what you're going to split up. Because right now, I can't treat you like a married couple. Now, had y'all been married, this would have been easy. If y'all was going to split up. But since you're shacking, we can't, whatever he had, whatever you got out of the house, you got, whatever she got out of the house, she got, y'all need to come. Go ahead and split and go about your business. Because I'm not going to stay here for two or three hours. Uh, which about 19, 19 what? Okay, how much did that cost? She said, we're not going to do that. Legally, had you been married, we could have easily split this up. But since she didn't want to be on the play house. So once again, the blessing of Abraham is this. All families shall be what? Blessed. Through who? Jesus Christ. We are blessed because of Jesus. So watch this as we move to uh, chapter 27 next week. Some of you already read chapter 27. We're going to close the book of Leviticus next week. Uh, I just want to let you know the title of that chapter next week is Promises, Promises. So I really want you to read chapter 27 next week as we prepare to close this. Any questions or comments about how we live the Christian life and how we should be living in holiness. Not to look at somebody else, but to what? Look at ourselves. The only time we are to say anything about somebody's sin is, watch this, when they expose themselves. 
Now we gotta, we gotta, we gotta talk to you. Come on in. Uh, we hear people always talk about some of these choir directors and the musicians who are homosexuals, and some said y'all knew he was homosexual before you hired him. Someone probably did know, but you know he bring in a good crowd. He pay his tithes though. And we get to concerts, he can pack a place. I went to concerts. We get some money, I ain't gonna mess with him. I can't go. That's what some preachers say. Leave him alone. But the scriptures don't say do that too. No, I'm paying you a paycheck, and so morally speaking, you're telling me that I'm more concerned about putting people in the seat than your life going to hell. I'm more concerned with having money in my pocket than your lifestyle going here. No, I can't do it. So watch this. If I hire anybody, I get to, see, because we're not publicly, we are private, we are a church, we can go there with our employees. Okay, who you live with? <laughs> yeah, we can do that. See, we can't do that in public. I can't do that at the school when I'm hiring people at the, at the school and I'm hiring positions for teachers. I can't do that because that's a public school. But in the private school, I can do that. But here, I can do it. I said, okay, who you live with? Well, oh, oh, that's your lifestyle. Well, no, this job is not for you. You want to openly have that? No, this job is not for you. We're looking for somebody who believes that, that in the Bible, all 66 books, not 33 books, but somebody who believes in all 66. Right? That's who we're looking for. Any, any other questions or comments we want to close with that? Yes, sir. You, know, you talked about the, uh, the Catholic Church. Yes. And how uh, there were two people went to the Arizona. Yes. I saw on TV today, but you know, when you touch the pope before the kiss is rain, all those people were kissing their hand. They weren't kissing his hand. Who not? The people who were, you know, you kiss the pope's hand. Yeah. They weren't kissing the pope's hand, they were kissing their own hand. Oh. He was snatching his hand back. Yeah. Did anybody see that? Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. yeah. So they were supposed, supposed to kiss his hand. They were upset with him. Oh, uh -huh. But they yeah. kissed their own hand. Oh, oh, he was his ring and they were out there kissing his hand. Supposed to kiss his ring. Yeah. Yeah. Beginning today, when everybody came up, when they went to, he did like this. Yep. He said, Why did he do that? Because it was because just not right. Oh, so he is against it. Yes. So he is he's still kissing his friend. Yeah. yeah. So he wanted to change it. He wanted to make it right. That's good. If he wanted to do that, that that'd be great. Because uh, what's the purpose of kissing the ring in the first place? They were, they were saying that the reason why they was kissing their hands because they was upset with the Pope's decision. Oh. Hey, that's why. Well, he said Every time he kissed their hand, he snatched their hand back. Oh, okay. That was, that was the thing. Okay, so they were just defying him. Defying him, yeah. Say, well, no, we're not going to kiss the ring. We're going to kiss your hand. So if you try to kiss his hand, he'll snatch his hand back. No, they were kissing their own hand. No, they were kissing their own hand. They weren't kissing his hand. They wouldn't even kiss his hand. No, they wouldn't do it. At all. <laughs> now, to me, if you're going to be defiant, in an organization, leave it. You don't need to be in an organization. Leave it. Just leave. See, there's some time. They'd rather, because they feel they don't have a voice, and they don't feel that they're cardinals or the people that can go talk to the poll, they don't have a voice. They, well, we just won't be in the, the organization and just be defiant. No. Look, you can find an organization that you can serve God in, that you feel comfortable with. Just re remember that. Look at our hands for word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you once again for being in your presence. Thank you for these, your children who are here. Thank you for allowing us to see this spiral of downward uh, destruction that we can stay away from.